so today we're going to talk about sonnets a little bit. Shakespeare's first sonnet, uh, as its second line, that thereby beauty's rose might never die. I'm going to talk about the sonnet today as this enduring form that we can't seem to get away from. And that, uh, and I think part of the reason that we can't get away from it is because Shakespeare does such a great job of it. And so, many themes of the sonnet, primarily time, he's considering our problem with time, we run out of time. So then the other theme becomes death, right? We're thinking about death, and of course you see at the end of this line the word die. And so, to keep from dying, we have to keep writing sonnets. All right, it doesn't really work, but we, we kind of imagine uh, that it does. Um, so this is my dog. Uh, my dog's name is Story, which is, my children named this dog when they were really little. Of course, it's a bit of an insult to me as a poet. Uh, to, you know, we could have named the dog Sonnet, uh, but they named it Story. But I'm interested in talking today a lot about story or lyric. The sonnet is primarily a lyric form. It creates this, sonnet literally means little song, okay? And a lyric, oftentimes, an easy way to think about lyric is that most lyrics work, you know, in this kind of vertical time, where if you think about, you know, um, if you think about horizontal time of a narrative, you know, you can jump forward in time and jump back, and of course we have timelines, you know, that we recognize that we use all the time like this. But a sonnet, the time is kind of all happening at once, you know, that things can be just kind of crushed down. We could have a poem, say, about a Grecian urn, and all the stuff on that urn is being considered all at once. It doesn't have to have a story where we're moving a plot from point A to point B with some kind of drama happening. So, anyways, beyond the dog. Okay, so I brought Helen Bentler's book just so you can see the big, gigantic brick of a book that this is. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful book called The Art of Shakespeare's Sonnets. I think it's kind of, from, from my view, uh, it's kind of unsurpassed is the depth at which she looks at the sonnets. She sh shows an, a facsimile version of the first quarto here, and then she has the kind of regularized English version here that's punctuated and everything. And you can even see uh, that there by beauties, rose, might never die, the different kind of spellings and stuff, the irregular or different kind of use of punctuation and, uh, and spelling that we use now. So, Today I'm not going to focus so much on Shakespeare, I'm going to try to say quite a bit. I think in some ways Helen Miller has said so much, it leaves me with very little to say. I want to talk a lot more about contemporary sonnets. So, let me see. I'm going to read a little bit here. Um, I, want to, I intend to speak today as a practicing poet, not as a, a scholar of sonnets, though certainly scholarly ideas may emerge. Shakespeare's sonnets work as a series, sub-series, sub-sub-series, and individually. I mean, there are 154 of these sonnets, you know, in this, in this bigger series, but they're broken down. Uh, you probably heard of the Dark Lady sonnets, which are the, the last bunch of sonnets um, in the series. The first 126, I think, 125 or 26, are written to this young man. There's also poems that are in there that are written to, toward a rival poet. So you have these different characters that are happening. And it's kind of interesting, that, uh, many scholars will argue that the last sonnets to the Dark Lady were written first. Now how they come to these conclusions we're not going to get into today. But those are bigger considerations of seeing each individual poem in that larger context, or the many contexts, or seeing them as we often see them, as say an individual poem, right? Uh, this poem you might give to your beloved, right? But seeing that one man wrote it towards another man might give you a completely different view, right? Many people will argue that it was this platonic 
friendship or deep love that one man had for another, but many now are arguing that there's a larger queer aspect to it. And so these conversations going on and on. Helen Bendler, who incidentally, to write this book, learned all of Shakespeare's 154 sonnets by heart. So if you want to be a scholar, uh, you know, you might consider what real scholars do. Paul Cantor's here, and um, you know, I know he knows a lot of Shakespeare by heart. Has said that the lyric is both more and less than a story. That the true actors in lyrics are words, not dramatic persons. And that's kind of been my approach today. Um, I'm a huge fan of Helen Bendler and her more aesthetic approach. I would argue alongside this perspective that the true scene of the lyric sonnet is the form rather than the stage or the setting. Okay. Also, I wanted to mention there is uh, another book on sonnets, a fantastic book by Stephen Burke called The Art of the Sonnet, in which he looks back at sonnets from ages past and gets all the way up to present. I think he really does well until he gets up to the 20th century, and then I think he really falls off because he begins talking about all the uh, forms that are really so far experimental, when I think there are a lot of sonnets that are very strict, actually, today. And by, by strict, I mean 14 lines of rhyming iambic pentameter. It's not so strict, because you can do a lot within that. But a lot of contemporary sonnets want to break a lot of other rules, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And this is uh, from the introduction to Wendler's book, and she talks about the different, what we have in the sonnet is 14 lines, right? And they're usually organized octave, eight lines, versus the sestet, six lines. And <coughs> she, what, with Shakespeare's sonnets, we have quatrain, 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 and then couplet. He's going to do something different, and I'll show you a slide after this that kind of shows that a little bit more. With uh, Vendler says, you know, oftentimes one of the things that the way we look at this organization is that we will set up a kind of uh, strategy of reading this of like, oh, I'm making my kind of statement, I'm revising my statement, I'm overturning the statement, and then whammo, I'm like you know, giving you some kind of epiphany or revelation within the last couplet. They're not all organized that way. Many of them, she says, and they can all be looked at in different ways. The stanzas can be looked at successive and equal, as hierarchical, as contrastive, analogous, logically contradictory, or successively louder or softer. And then she admits that that's only, you know, th this list is merely suggestive, not exhaustive. There's a lot of different ways to look at how Shakespeare organizes these sonnets. So to kind of simplify it, I think probably in high school a lot it says, oh, they probably want to help kids get their heads around it and say that the way that these things work. But they work far beyond that kind of organization. Okay. Bendler quoting Stephen notes that a poem must be beautiful, made of both the poetry of the idea and the poetry of the words. Uh, the poem is both semantic um, or uh, meaningful, but it also is sonic, syntactic, grammatical, and ultimately ontological. Many sonnets are very much about the sonic form itself, or about poetry itself. Uh, and so that's something to always pay attention to. Bender calls it a, a verbal contraption. I think uh, I pref it seems a little too oddly clinical to me. I prefer Donald Hall's phrase, um, a language machine. OK, let's get to this um, organization. I'm going to have to stay on track here, because it's going to be hard to get through this in 40 minutes. And I do want to leave some time for question and answer afterwards. And probably one of the things you might want to talk about is when we get to these different sonnets, uh, if you want to talk about one of them, make yourself a note, and I'll flash back to it so we can have it up on the screen in front of us. So this is generally what we're going to look at here as far as the shape of all these poems today. OK, where's my laser pointer? OK, so you can see with the Italian, we have what we call envelope or brace rhyme, that you have the A 
rhymes bracing this, the B rhymes, right? And here it is again, right? So technically you could break this into two quatrains, but it's holding together as a whole, as an octave, right? And then down below here we have the sestet, and the sestet varies in different ways. C, D, C, D, C, D, or C, D, E, C, D, E, or C, D, D, C, C, D, and there's other variations of the sestet in Italian form, right? And uh, with the Elizabethan or Shakespearean, and there's some variations on this, and I'll show you a Sydney poem in a second, you're going to see the variation on that. But what Shakespeare does that I think is so innovative is we have A, B, A, B. These are called alternate rhymes or alternating. You can see how the rhyme is alternating, and it's not holding things together, but it's letting each thing take its turn as kind of a development forward. Then C, D, C, D then E, F, E, F, and then G, G. You can see when you hit this couplet here that something different happens. And that's why we have this kind of jolt, this kind of regular expectation of some kind of twist or surprise or epiphany at the very end. One thing to notice about this, as opposed to the Italian, for English, this is much better. It allows us a lot of freedom. We have seven rhymes here, seven different rhyming pairs. Over here, if you look at this first form, if you're going to go with this, this first, the C, D, C, D, C, D, you have one, two, A, B, C, D. You have four rhymes possible in the entire thing. Over here, seven rhymes. Now, if you think about English as a kind of rhyme-poor language in comparison to the Romance languages, Italian, you know, French, and so on, those poems, because of conjugations, because of other aspects of the language, can create a lot more in the way of rhyme. Uh, English doesn't have that. Now, we have that with kind of slant rhyme, but that doesn't create the same music for the ear that true rhyme does. So, Shakespeare really is allowing himself to do a lot more with his sonnets by virtue uh, you know, of using this form. Let's move forward one. Okay, so here's Sidney, who's a little bit before Shakespeare. Not by much in writing his sonnets. You can see the pattern of the rhyme here. Woe, face, disgrace, no, showcase, place, Flow. So you have the brace rhymes, it looks very Italian, and then things breed, brings read, tragedy me. So he's kind of com he kind of sets up this final couplet before Shakespeare, right? Where and that's very different. You know, you see he's got this first Italian beginning, but then that thing, and I'm I you know I'm not sure because I'm not a Shakespearean scholar whether Shakespeare saw this and then it influenced him to create it, but it's good to know that this kind of exists a little bit beforehand, that rhyming couplet at the end. This is one of my favorite sonnets of all time. And I've written a little bit about this, but um, the way that Sidney uses the pronouns and the, and the persons in this poem, we see that Stella, this is his beloved, astrophil means literally star lover and star, here we have the Greek and the more Latinate uh, word, but these two different people who are coming together in all these sonnets, these are love poems. And again, I didn't mention this, but the, the sonnet is traditionally a love poem. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a second. But we see Stella here, off sees the very face of woe painted in my good cloud and stormy face, but cannot steal to pity my disgrace. So he's lamenting that she doesn't get him you know, and yet hearing late a fable, we're back to the idea of story, right? Which did show of lovers never known a gri grievous case, pity thereof gat in her breast such place. She's moved by stories. And so Sidney's like, uh, hey, what can I do with that? Because I want to get this woman's attention. She's not paying attention to me. And then the poem develops. Alas, a fancy drawn by image things, though false, yet with free scope more grace doth breathe than servants rack, where new doubts honor brings. Then think, my dear, that you and me do read 
see me as a story, right, of lovers ruined some sad tragedy. I am not I. Like, pity the tale of me. So I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a tragedy, I'm a story, I'm a tale. But look what he does with the pronouns here. We go from Stella, and then all of a sudden the poem shifts, and it's directed towards this you. She becomes, she goes from third person to second person here. And the other thing in it is that he goes from, not, he's not first person or first person subject, he becomes first person object at the very end. I, just, I love this poem. There's a lot more going on with this. But uh, Sydney's absolutely brilliant. Okay, there's story again, because we're talking about story. Um, good dog. Okay. I try, no, PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, Dante's one of the uh, first writers of the sonnet. Okay? He writes this thing called La Vida Nuova. Apparently, there's a guy a little bit before him, Giacomo Dalentini, who writes sonnets. And so he's called the inventor of the sonnet. There may have been somebody before him, but we don't have the record of it. But Dante, very early on, picks it up, and he uses it in this thing called La Vida Nuova, which is a fantastic book that you all should read if you're interested in literature. As a matter of fact, people talk a lot about hybrid this or that these days. You know, as if we just discovered hybridity in literature. Dante's writing this big prose piece in which he's sticking sonnets in the middle of it. And he'll write the prose, and he's telling his story of this woman, Beatrice, that he's met, and he's known her since she was nine years old, and he sees her again nine years later. Nine is very significant for Dante. But within this, after he tells what happens, he says, and then, so I wrote a little sonnet about it, and here it is. And so he, start, you know, he writes these sonnets that are absolutely extraordinary, and then he'll go on and explain more, and he'll go on and on. And there are also these other songs and longer poems that are nested in here as well. Uh, but you should know that Dante, or very early on, writes, uh, writes the sonnet as a love poem. Okay, let's move back forward to Petrarch several hundred years later. Now again, look at Petrarch's pattern. Sparsi, Avogea, Ardea, Scarsi, Farsi, Parea, Avea, Arsi, Mortale, Parole, Humana, Vole, Tale, Sana. Right? So you see, you can see here that these, that the octave is holding together and the sestet is holding together by virtue of sound. I've been teaching the sonnet in my creative writing class. I've been saying, you know, because these things hold together differently to our ear, when you're writing one, you really want to kind of have a break in between the octave and the sestet. It's just kind of, your ear is telling you that there should be a break. And so, you know, your mind should also be following along with that. Okay. And again, all these poems are written to a, a woman named Laura. They're all love poems. Okay. Spencer writes a series of love poems called I'm, I'm Already. Look at his pattern. This is actually really interesting. So, you could, and again, we're going to see so many different inventions of the pattern. You think, oh, all the patterns are used up. No, you can, do a, you can still do a lot with this. Strand, away, hand, pray. Assay, mortalize, decay, likewise. You see what's going on here? We have this movement forward. See, the B rhyme here ends up becoming this, the next set of rhymes here. It's like this Dante and terza rima, where there's one step forward, one step back. One, it's almost like a little terza rima thing that he's doing. And then he has, as well, that final couplet. Okay. And that's a, obviously one of his more famous uh, poems. Okay, I want to show you something about T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. We're going to jump way, way forward into English here. This is one of the great, this is one of the reasons that The Wasteland is one of the greatest poems of the 20th century. Dante, I mean, Eliot takes this kind of traditional form of the, of the, of the sonnet, which has traditionally been known as a love poem, 
And what does he do with it? In the midst of the fire sermon, we have these two, these two figures. You have this young man, this young clerk, and this young typist. And basically, they're just two young, poor, lower middle class kind of people who, they're, I don't know, they're kind of dating, but they haven't quite figured it out. They clearly, it seems to me, kind of don't love each other. Um, but they're kind of going through the motions of dating. Maybe some of you are engaged in these kind of activities. Um, but th at this point, uh, this guy, uh, and they're in the room together, and he said, the time is now propitious, as he guesses. The meal is ended. She is bored and tired, endeavors to engage her in caresses, which still are unreproved if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once. Exploring hands encounter no defense. This guy is like, if you haven't figured it out at this point, this is kind of like a date rape, right? Um, his vanity requires no response and makes a welcome of indifference. That's kind of a famous phrase, right? Um, and I, Tiresias, have for suffered all and acted on the same divan or bed. I, who sat by thieves below the wall and walked among the lowest of the dead. That's so Eliot. If you've ever heard Eliot, it just... You know, he's got this singular voice. And here we come to the couplet, right? This is a sonnet in the midst of a much longer piece. It's hidden within here. Bestows one final patronizing kiss and gropes his way, finding the stairs unlit. Look what happens there. We've got guesses, tired, caresses, desired, wants, defense, response, indifference. We're in this Shakespearean sonnet, right? Oh, a love poem. Yeah, but the opposite is happening. This is this deep modern irony that we know, you know, happens uh, that springs out of Pound and Eliot kind of embracing the deeply ironic. But look what happens in the rhyming couplet. Bestows one final patronizing kiss and gropes his way, finding the stairs unlit. Look what he rhymes kiss with, with unlit. It doesn't rhyme. The I rhymes, right? The short I. But the the S goes to a, a hard T, right? And what happens? You're in darkness. Things are just completely unlit. You think, well, okay, that's amazing, right? What does he begin to do again? He's going to write a double sonnet. Glass, lover, pass, over, and alone, hand, grand, phone. And you can read the rest on your own. It's absolutely extraordinary. Okay. You guys are kind of quiet. I think it's mind blowing, right? Nod your head. Okay. <laughs> okay. Up to a more uh, contemporary poem by Alicia Stallings, one of my favorite contemporary formal writers. And Stallings is a uh, is a classicist who lives in Greece, explaining affinity for bats. Well, look at the pattern here. What do you see? You see a very strict Italian form. I was just saying, you know, well, it's, English is pretty rhyme poor. I think really good poets, we, we like the challenge. We're like, oh, I can't do that? I'm going to go back. So she goes back to the Italian form, and she does it amazingly. I'll read through this one. And remember, this is about bats, these things that fly through the air at night, right? That they are only glimpsed in silhouette and seem something else at first, a swallow, and move like new tunes difficult to follow, staggering towards an obstacle they yet avoid in a last minute pirouette, somehow telling solid things from hollow, sounding out how high a space or shallow, revising into deepening violet. It's a nice coda right there for the for the octave. That they sing. Not the way the songbird sings, whose song is wrote to ornament finesse, but travel by a sort of song that rings, true not in utterance, but hearkening, who find their way by calling into darkness to hear their voice bounce off the shape of things. Now I want to show you something about this poem. This poem begun, it begins very much with the eye, right? That we're talking about the way that we're seeing things, and it's getting darker, right? If bats are coming out at night, we're in that kind of twilight mode, right? And we end on this deepening violet. We realize that it's getting to be nighttime to where we can't, we can't see anymore. Her, her focus then changes to the ear, 
So she starts talking, instead of all the stuff she's talking about seeing at the beginning, about singing. Okay, this poem is about being a poet. All right, explaining an affinity for bat. Why do I like the bat? Because I'm a poet. It's I follow my ear. And of course, look at, she chooses these, you know, only four rhymes so she can hear that echoing, right? Echolocation that the bat does. Hearing your voice bounce off the shape of things. I could say so much more about this sonnet. You, get, you can obviously tell there's a lot to discover here. But we're going to have to go for it. So I want to talk about a few more. Okay, Melissa Range was just here, um, and she read her poem, Lamp Black. This is a beautiful poem. Let's look at this form again. She's doing something a little bit different here. We go from plume, ravens, resin, doom. So we see we have the brace rhyme, right? Then we have grime, ribbon, shriven, time. And then we have sin, burns, carbon, overturned, pen, born, right? So clearly we have... The, that structure again of octave and sestet that seems to stand out. One thing that interests me though, and that I was thinking about yesterday as I was looking at, at this, was that all these lines, every single line ends in an end word that has an M or an N sound, right? That creates this kind of humming that kind of overtakes this poem. That's about darkness and death and dying, but it's also very much about ink, you know, and as we talked about in our class, um, she has all these sonnets that are about these different uh, pigments. This one being, uh, you know, the dark, you know, the darkest pigment, pigment, obviously. So, again, the sonnet avails itself to talking about it has this self-reflexive nature. It talks again and again about the kind of the writing of the poem, and she's doing it here throughout. Carbon, you know, this lead that we're using. But then we realize by the end uh, that this ink, this carbon, that we are carbon-based animals, <laughs> right? We're organic. Anything living is carbon-based, and so that seems to uh, seems to be important. I also think of diamonds. Ultimately. But that's a whole different issue. Notice the last word of the poem is born. We go from black to born. Seems to me that she's trying to get at this positive ag aspect of, of living with this darkness. Okay. There's a lot more to say about that poem as well, but we're going to keep moving. Because I just have about 10 more minutes. This poem is absolutely genius. I, I talk about this poem all the time. Uh, look at the rhymes on this one. Key, Foucault, Assault, Paraguay. Naivete, Chart, Theaters, Exegete. Enough, Parquet, Duet, Through, Epitome, Dome. They're all I rhymes, right? They don't rhyme to the ear. Their illusions. This poem is all about the illusion of the church, of the painting on the ceiling of the church of San Ignacio um, in Rome. Um, it's also about the illusion of a relationship. These two lovers who are trying to come together. One's a, pil one's a pilgrim, one's a believer uh, in spiritual things, and one is a doubter, as a, or a pagan, as he calls himself. This poem sets up diametrical opposites throughout the, uh, the entire thing. This is a Shakespearean sonnet, you can see it from the form, right? But he chooses not to rhyme. And we end, I think, with a great sense of despair that these two can never match up. Or do opposites attract? Again, it's, this is a poem very much about the eye and the ear uh, in a different way. Than, um, than Alicia Stalling's poem. But it'd be nice to think, you know, somebody could write a paper on this to contrast these two and talk about I and Ear. I'm not looking at anybody specifically, but you know, it's something to think about. I don't have time to talk about it because I have to talk about it some more. Okay. I, I could just go on and on about how amazing this poem is. This is a, just a perfect poem. Okay.
Greg Williamson, one of the uh, best formal poets of my generation. He has an entire book of sonnets called, oh crap, I'm forgetting the name. It's a line from Berryman. Anyways, but they're all about death, and they all turn on the word, you know, because you have to good, you need to make a transition usually between line eight and nine. Every single one of his poems turns on the word until, okay? And the, the titles of the poem are always the last word of the poem. He, so again, you have a, a, a poet saying, I gotta challenge myself to do something new with the sonnet. So he writes, I think there are about 80 of them. Um, and I'll show you actually the table of contents because it is in itself a poem. But he has poems that are just very, you know, kind of everyday stuff. I, I love this poem, Beer. A mildly alcoholic beverage. And four words to get your whole iambic pentameter line. Um, made from a malted farinaceous grain combined with choice hops and allowed to age. Beer is proof God loves us. Benjamin Franklin. And we'd fain have beer, beer, beer is having given us so much. Beer bong, beer gut and goggles, beer induced liaisons. Bless its beery heart, a crutch? No way, man. Beer me. You are getting juiced. He, um, Williamson is fantastic at using just everyday speech in the vernacular, but very much in the structure, right, of Iambic pentameter. Until, right, you split to meet the great beer man. And his poems are always about, well, everything, here's this thing, but then you die. <laughs> right. You know, and the 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 sestet is about, well, we die. You meet the great beer man himself. It's party time. They serve a nice cold draft, and you're a legend here, immortalized in stone, an artisan, artiste, the grit, the showmanship, the verb, and your last words. Watch this man. Hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> too good, too good. Um, here's his table of contents. I don't, uh, hopefully, I don't know if you can see this. Hopefully you can. Time, space, stars, sun, moon, earth, fire, water, ice, snow, rain, wind. You can see, right, these various ideas about like, what, well, what's the next poem that I've got to write? What's the next one? What's the connective tissue between this and that? I love where it gets down to here. You know, trees, garden, man, woman. Okay, we're back to the beginning, right, of time. Sex. Of course, sex, again, two poems called sex. Well, why would you do that? Oh, you know. Um, <laughs> DNA, baby, right? <laughs> it's interesting, baby comes before marriage. Um, yeah, don't do that. Um, law, school, and then, yeah, college. And then college, books, criticism, Line, circle, square, smell, taco, beer, marijuana. Okay, that's enough of that. But I love, here we get down to the 10 space time dimensional universe. Um, towards the end, the Hubble constant light and black and white. These are all signs, and they're, uh, they're just fantastic. So if you email me, I'll tell you the name of the book. I can't think of it right now. A most marvelous piece of luck. <laughs> That's the title. Yes. Extra credit, Jasmine. Okay. And this is a sonnet that I wrote. I figured I'd end with, with, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to do this thing too, you know? And so um, you can see my pattern here, carries, learn, bury, burn, height, Shoulder, night, older, wrecked, higher, effect, wire, thing, chain. And one of the things that I did with this sonnet is that um, I tried to, uh, I'm going to escape out of this. I made a film, some of you may have seen this before, so apologies if you're going to watch this again. But I'm going to show you this video poem that I made. And then I'll open it up to questions and comments. Sonnet on time. You recognize what weight the river carries. 
imagining your body swims to learn the current. Then, but what below would bury your errors, even troubles? What lusts burn and might be baptized, raised, surprised to the height of love, floating? Earth the river's shoulder is imperceptibly removed like night, believing in its wisdom. As grows older, each star awakening to know its wrecked and fixed position in a myth. Higher, we ask how time exists beyond effect. Marrow and bone, electrons on a wire, the river rises to meet the falling rain. Whose strokes make time sweaty on its gold watch chain?